The final parsec problem is a huge mystery of black hole astrophysics. According to the maths, supermassive black holes should never merge in the universe's lifetime. And yet all our observations and theories of how the universe evolves suggests they should. And therein lies the problem. But is it really a problem at all? Is there something we've just missed in the maths? Or is the maths right and supermassive black holes don't ever merge in the universe like we expect? So let's dive into this. We're going to chat about first, why we expect supermassive black hole mergers to happen. Two, the physics of how supermassive black holes get closer together. Three, why they store when they are a parsec apart, which gives us the final parsec problem. And four, what observations could help us figure out if this problem really exists. So let's start with the first thing on that list there, why we expect supermassive black hole mergers to happen. So first of all, we find supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, islands of billions of stars out in the universe. And we think there's a supermassive black hole in the center of every single galaxy. Now, I've made a whole video on why we think that before going through the science history of the past hundred years worth of research, if you want more detail on that. But what it means in the context of this video, if you have a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy, is that when two galaxies merge together, we then also expect there's supermassive black holes in the centers to merge as well. Now, mergers are fairly common. Around about 10% of galaxies will merge with another one of roughly the same size and mass in their lifetimes. And we see a correlation between the mass of stars in a galaxy and the mass of the central supermassive black hole. So we know that the two co-evolve. They grow together over time, with the most massive galaxies formed in mergers having the most massive supermassive black hole. Holes. Plus, our current best theory of the universe and how it's evolved has galaxies merging together hierarchically, with proto-galaxies merging to make ever larger and larger structures, and so on. So, the expectation is, if galaxies merge, then their supermassive black holes in the center merge as well. But that's not what the maths tells us. Which brings me to part two. What physics is actually going on to bring two supermassive black holes close together? Because galaxy mergers are messy. They are a hot mess of gas and stars and black holes getting flung out everywhere. So if that happens and the two supermassive black holes get flung apart from each other in the merger, what physical process actually brings them back together again? Well, it's something known as dynamical friction. The physics of which has been understood for a long time, since 1943, when Subrahamian Chandrasekhar detailed the equations needed to explain how objects in space whether that's stars like Chandrasekhar focused on, but also gas particles as well. And we now know it's applicable to black holes as well. But whatever it is, whatever object, it can lose energy by interacting with other objects in space. Sort of like a drag force. In fact, it is often known as gravitational drag. It's the same process that happens to spacecraft in the solar system when they slingshot around a planet to gain energy and get out to the far reaches of the solar system. And in the process, the planet technically loses energy as well, but given how tiny the spacecraft is in comparison to the massive planet, the energy loss of the planet is absolutely tiny, whereas the energy gain for the spacecraft is absolutely massive. And the same thing can happen for black holes as they interact with stars and gas in the galaxy as well. The black hole being more massive will lose energy, whereas the stars and the gas being less massive will gain energy. They'll get a boost and get flung away from the black hole. And as the black hole loses energy, it starts to slow down and it slowly sinks towards the center of mass of the system, which when all the galaxy mergers calm down is the middle of the galaxy. Now, just like in the spacecraft gravitational slingshot example before with the planet, the supermassive black hole is so much more massive than the stars and the gas that it's interacting with. So the amount of energy it loses is absolutely tiny. So it means you need a lot of interactions over a very long time 
time period for the supermassive black hole to lose enough energy and actually sink towards the center. The same thing also has to happen though for the other supermassive black hole that's come in from the galaxy merger. And so it does take a really, really long time, but eventually the two supermassive black holes will end up in orbit around that center of mass of the resulting galaxy. Once they're in orbit though, they'll stay like that unless they keep losing energy through dynamical friction by interacting with nearby stars and gas so that they can actually, again, slow down, reduce their speed and end up getting closer and closer to that center of mass where the two of them would eventually merge. So that brings me to part three. How do we actually end up then at the final parsec problem? Well, the thing is with two very heavy supermassive black holes orbiting each other, they end up clearing the entire area around them of stars and gas. They essentially interact with everything they possibly could. But again, through that dynamical friction process, the stars and gas gain energy and they get flung outwards so there's nothing left for the two black holes to interact with and therefore lose energy. And they stall in their orbit around each other at about three light years or so from each other, or around about a parsec. This was first highlighted by Begelman, Blanford and Rees in 1980, who ran the maths for the first time, essentially. And in this graph, they've plotted the distance separating the two supermassive black holes against the time it takes to get to that separation. The y-axis here is a log scale. So 10 to the six is a one with six zeros after it. So a million years here. 10 to the 10 is a one with 10 zeros after it. So 10 billion years. So if you go above that, you getting towards the age of the universe, which our current best estimate is that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So hopefully what you can see in this graph is that you shrink from 100 parsecs to a parsec relatively quickly on astronomical time scales, so around about a million years or so. But then the distance between them stalls, taking longer than the age of the universe to get any closer together. Now, I know when I mentioned the final parsec problem in a video in passing a few weeks ago, many of you were like, but what about black holes losing energy through gravitational waves? Well, this is plotted on this plot as well. You can see that if the two black holes get closer than 0.01 parsecs, then they actually can start losing energy through gravitational waves. So ripples through space itself caused by the extreme bending and then unbending of space as the two supermassive black holes orbit each other. But that can only happen when the two supermassive black holes get very close to each other. Between one parsec and 0.01 parsec, so 1% of a parsec, the black holes are apparently stuck at that distance orbiting each other with no way to lose energy, resulting in the final parsec problem. But is this really a problem? Because if this actually happens in the universe, that supermassive black holes don't merge and they just end up orbiting each other for the rest of the time, stalling about a parsec away from each other, then we don't have a problem because our maths and our interpretation and our understanding of what is going on physically was always right. We just need to change our interpretation of galaxy evolution and how galaxies and black holes evolve together. But if supermassive black holes do actually merge out there in the universe, then we do have a problem because our maths is wrong and therefore our theory and understanding of what's going on in terms of all the dynamical friction is wrong. Now there have been a few studies over the years that have claimed just that, that our maths isn't quite right. And the two supermassive black holes can actually lose enough energy. If for example, you have another galaxy merger, which brings in a third supermassive black hole, which can interact with the other two and then get slingshotted out. Or perhaps that the supermassive black holes will have an interaction with a gas disk much closer in, or by just recycling the stars back in close towards the two supermassive black holes on more realistic orbits. But there's still a lot of uncertainty there and there's no general agreement in the scientific literature yet. Which brings me to part four. What observations could actually help us crack this problem and work out do supermassive black holes actually 
merge together. Well, people who've tried looking for dual active supermassive black holes in the centres of galaxies, what I've lovingly dubbed double yokers, and you can try and determine how close they are, or you can look for strange shapes in the jets that are burped off from the regions around the supermassive black hole in the centre, like we detect using radio telescopes, you know, those could get warped as the two black holes get closer together. But there's been no convincing evidence on any of those fronts so far. The smoking gun to prove that supermassive black holes merge would be to detect the gravitational waves that come from that in spiral when the two supermassive black holes are getting close enough to actually merge. You know, and experiments to do this were being proposed way back in the 1970s by the likes of Thorne and Braginsky. And of course now we do have gravitational wave detectors here on Earth in the form of LIGO and Virgo, but those detectors are only sensitive to the gravitational waves from the mergers of much less massive black holes. Black holes that are the same sort of mass as stars, anywhere from sort of five-ish times the mass of the sun to, you know, a hundred times the mass of the sun, rather than supermassive black holes, which are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. Now, I've made a whole video before on why that is and why they're only sensitive to that specific frequency of gravitational wave, if you want to check that out. But it means that we cannot use LIGO or Virgo, our only gravitational wave detectors we have so far, to try and detect the gravitational waves from the merger of supermassive black holes. Holes. Now, there was a slight breakthrough recently, and it was using pulsar timing arrays. So pulsars are dead stars that are scattered across the entire galaxy to make a galaxy-sized gravitational wave detector. And five international collaborations announced that they detected a signal of gravitational waves that were the right frequency to be from the merger of supermassive black holes. Again, I covered all of this in much more detail in another video, which I'll link down below if you're interested. But to summarize that video as quickly as I can, yes, one explanation for those gravitational waves is the mergers of supermassive black holes, but it could also be something else entirely. Like, for example, gravitational waves from the first few seconds of the universe's life when it went through incredibly rapid expansion that we know as inflation. And everyone is incredibly excited because whatever explanation it ends up being, and there's a lot of analysis going on right now to work out what actually is responsible for this gravitational wave signal that's been detected, but whatever it ends up being, it's going to be incredibly exciting because we're going to learn something new and get at some new physics. But never fear, because there are plans in place for a detector like LIGO, but that would be sensitive to the gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. The problem is these gravitational waves have huge wavelengths. We're talking like light year long wavelengths, which is why pulsar timing arrays we use, because you could make a detector that was the size of the galaxy. And if you're going to build a detector like LIGO, it means that you need a detector that is larger than the size of the Earth. So the Laser Interferometer Space Antennae, or LISA, is set to launch in 2037, with three detectors separated by 2.5 million kilometers kept in stable positions as they orbit the Sun, trailing the Earth. So it is a big project. And once it's finally developed and launched and up and running, the entire astronomy community is just going to be on tenterhooks waiting to find out how many gravitational wave events will actually detect. Because if it's lots of events, then clearly supermassive black hole mergers are happening all over the universe every time galaxies merge. And therefore, the final parsec problem is actually a problem because we've got something wrong in the maths and our understanding of what is going on is clearly wrong. But if we launch LISA and get it up and running and it's just crickets? then we'll have a different kind of problem, but it will mean that the final parsec problem isn't a problem at all, because it means that we got the maths right. It's just that supermassive black holes will never merge in the universe's lifetime. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Now, I know that a lot of the topics in my videos are incredibly complex. It can seem that way if you're not familiar with the basics of physics or the maths that's used to derive those concepts. 
but never fear because there is a fun, easy, and free way to change that. Brilliant is a website and an app where you can learn science and maths interactively with thousands of lessons from the basics to more advanced topics and new lessons added every month. Brilliant guided lessons that you explore new concepts at your own pace. So if you get stuck, there are helpful hints and also step-by-step -step solutions to get you back on track. At the minute, I'm particularly loving their data analysis fundamentals course, which gets you to analyze real data, draw your own conclusions, because not only are data skills massively in demand on the job market, the minute, but it's this kind of analysis that underpins a lot of the astrophysics research that I cover on my channel. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that do are going to get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant again for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. Let's do this, because it's the final parsec. Doo -doo -doo -doo. We all know that was coming, right? It's, it's been in my head for weeks. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> Boost and flinging out to the outskirts of the solar system away. The solar system? Ooh. Uh, for everybody still wondering why I'm not back in my normal filming area, it's because I still haven't bought any lights since they broke in what, like, Night Sky News from last month? Yeah, I need to get on that. <laughs> is it actually going to detect? Because if it's lo lost, if it's lost, let's hope it's not lost. Don't want to lose Lisa in the depths of space, thank you. And the plane going over and it's very loud. I can crack my back in the meantime, I think, though. That would be incredible. One sec. No, it's not going to go. Rude. <laughs>